Good afternoon, this is Brian. Today is Tuesday, July 5th, 2022, and I'm in the Laguna Mountains in central, the central part of East County, San Diego County, and I want to do a spotlight on shrubs video today. Today's spotlight is on the beautiful, beautiful Utah service berry. Here we have it. Amelanchier utahensis. So Utah service berry is a sometimes small to sometimes very large winter deciduous shrub, meaning the leaves fall off in autumn, the plant is leafless in, win in winter and early spring, and then by mid-spring it gets its new leaves. That's what winter deciduous means. This is a small to very large winter deciduous shrub in the rose family, the Rosaceae. So what we have here is quite a large specimen. Well, this is one of the larger specimens I've ever seen of a Melanchier utahensis. This one's probably about 12 feet tall. I imagine they can occasionally get a little bit larger than this. But this is one of the larger specimens I've seen personally. So, we're talking about these awesome shrubs here. We're going to start with the foliage, is usually where I start. So, it's July, so obviously this plant is in full leaf. It's fully leafed out, it's already blossomed, and it's going into fruit. So today I won't be able to show you the flowers, but I will be able to show you the fruit in various stages of development. So let's start off with the leaves first. The leaves are relatively small on our species of Utah, uh, our, our specimens here. Utah service berry leaves are quite small, usually maybe up to an inch, maybe an inch and a half, maybe two inches on uh, more vigorous specimens growing in wetter locations. But you can see here, they're relatively ovate and they're tooth edged. As you can see here, the leaves are quite tooth edged. And they grow on these short spurt, these little short twigs that are kind of grayish in color. And you can get relatively smooth gray bark here as you move up the larger branches. And even the, the older trunks are relatively smooth here on Amelanchier Utahensis. So let's get close to the trunk of this without uh, poking my eardrum out with a twig. So you can see there's some slight striation or markings in the bark if you look closely. But it's mostly a medium gray. Obviously, since this is a, more of a shrub, it's going to be thicket forming, multi-trunked, as you can see here. And usually the trunks are quite small, slender. And once these get to mature size like this, they're often quite quite round, kind of kind of round crowned. This one's a very full crown specimen. Sometimes younger specimens and not so vigorous ones can be quite scraggly and straggly, especially in the younger age, they tend to be a little more a little more on the straggly side. Here's a younger specimen here actually that I can compare with. Here's a younger specimen right here. Still quite decent size actually. Not quite as old. And not quite as densely, or not, not quite as spread out. This one with age tends to spread out. A lot of the younger specimens tend to be quite upright. As you can see here, a lot of this is upright, but as the fruits are developing, it's starting to weigh the branches down a little bit. So that is sometimes what happens with these plants when they are in fruit. So, You're seeing the leaves and they, they kind of look similar to mountain mahogany, Cercocarpus, which is another species in the rose family, or another genus of shrubs and trees in the rose family. So again, let's look at these leaves. As you can see here, quite round, sawtoothed edged or serrate, especially on the upper two thirds of the leaf. The lower portions of the leaf towards the petiole are a little smoother. So, 
it does look similar to birch leaf mountain mahogany or birch leaf circuit carpus, and that's this right here, circuit carpus betuloides variety betuloides. Major difference is circuit carpus betuloides leaves are a lot fuzzier and, f and whiter and fuzzier on the underside as well. And the leaves are much more persistent on birch leaf mountain mahogany. Most, of, most, most specimens tend to be evergreen or semi-evergreen, but they can occasionally be partially, partially winter deciduous or drought deciduous. Whereas Utah service berry, which does have a lighter color on the underside as well, doesn't have the prominent fuzziness that birch leaf mountain mahogany does. And this is completely winter deciduous. In other words, by the end of fall, by some time in fall, through early spring, this plant is completely leafless. No leaves on it. So, depending on your elevation, we are approximately 6,000 feet in elevation. You're going to mostly find this shrub above 5,000 feet. You will occasionally see it lower than that, maybe on occasion. But you will see this usually above 5,000 feet, sometimes significantly above it. I've seen it above 8,000 feet before. And this plant's habitat is quite variable because where I am, I'm in a, in a predominantly Jeffrey Pine and California Black Oak forest right now. And this is an understory species that has taken root and gotten quite large in this opening here where it can get some more sun. This plant does like to be out in the full sun and it does have quite a bit of drought tolerance. So while you will find it in fairly decently packed forests like this, you're also going to find this in pinyon juniper woodland on the desert side of the mountains. And of course you'll find it here in the mixed conifer forest. Sometimes you'll find them in very thick Jeffrey, sugar pine, white fir forests, and incense cedar in uh, the San Gabriel Mountains. I've seen it along the uh, the trail, the Pacific Crest Trail, heading up to Mount Baden Powell. In fact, I'm just off the Pacific Crest Trail right now. PCT is right over here, but I'm in San Diego County. <laughs> so, and then you can also find this growing in chaparral sometimes as well, although it's not always as prominent in chaparral as it would be in pinyon juniper woodland, conifer forest, and oak woodlands. So this will grow both on the coastal and the desert side of the mountains. Sometimes I have tend to notice it more on the interior side of the mountains facing the desert. I've noticed that a little bit more than I've noticed it on the coastal side. But I've seen it, like I said, I've seen it near Mount Baden, the base of Mount Baden-Powell by Vincent Gap, and that's, you know, kind of, there's a little bit of coastal influence there. So, now we're going to talk about the flowers. Mid to late spring, after this shrub is leafed out, you're going to get these beautiful white five petal flowers that are quite noticeable and quite showy when the plant is blooming in mass. Again, we're past flowering season, so we're not going to see any. They're five petaled, kind of, then the petals are kind of narrow kind of narrow. I'm not sure if they're fragrant or not. I've never been up to sniff a flower before, so I'm not sure if they're really fragrant. But then after they flower, they develop these small fruits that look like berries. Hence the name service berry. However, it's not a berry. The fruit is a poem. It's a poem. P-O-M-E. As you can see here, a lot of uh, poems in the and the rose family, I believe, is the, the sole family that produces pomiferous fruits. I believe. Don't quote me on that, but I believe that only the rose family will produce poems. So poems are these fruits. We can see the little, little sepals of the flower still persisting on the edge of it. And that's the case in a lot of rosaceae, or a lot of rose family plants. So they develop these kind of roundish, globose, berry-like poems. And a poem is a fruit that has a core with a with a seed to a couple of seeds inside of the core. So, 
botanically, the fruit of service berry is related to apples and pears, quinces, and even our uh, local low elevation chaparral shrub, the toyon. Also, the pyracantha species that are that are commonly cultivated with their red berry-like poems in the fall, called scarlet firethorns. Those are all poems. And these are edible when they're ripened. So right now, most of the fruits are green, so they, this plant did not flower very long ago. Did not flower very long ago. And the fruits will darken, darken through red as they get close to being ripe. So here we go. This one I don't think is quite ripened yet. I think it still has a little bit of darkening to do. So you see there, start turning red. And once they're fully ripened, I don't, I've never tried a service berry poem before, but they are edible. I don't believe they're supposed to be the, the tastiest fruits around. But then again, I've never tried it personally. And sometimes you can be surprised at how quite delicious some of our native fruits can be, especially if you have a, a pretty open palate. But quite beautiful, quite beautiful. And then so during the course of the summer, these poems are going to ripen, and wildlife relish them. Native Americans ate them. And another cool thing about these is when autumn comes, certain, uh, certain individuals can get some, some quite nice fall color. Now, like most of our winter deciduous shrubs and trees here in Southern California, most of them are going to change into a yellowish color. However, I have witnessed individuals that get orange as a fall color. One time I was hiking up a Forest Service road near Hart Bar Peak in the San Bernardino Mountains, and I was maybe about 7,600 7, feet in elevation, hiking up this dirt road. It was in early September of all times, and a lot of these shrubs are already colored in orange, even with some lightly reddish tinges, and a lot of them with yellow. So sometimes the fall color can be quite nice and attractive on this plant. Uh, like I said, most of the times it's going to be more of a yellowish color, but there can be occasions where this shrub can turn orange and maybe even slight tinges of red come fall. Of course, at the elevation where I was that one day in the San Bernardinos, fall, uh, fall colors come a little bit earlier. Places like this would be more likely October when this is coloring. But you see this one, this specimen here, this is like, a, this is why I'm glad I took the Pacific Crest Trail here. Because I've been needing to spotlight this shrub for a very long time, and I could not have found a better specimen to spotlight than this one here. And apparently, this plant's fruits are quite viable. As, as you can see, a lot of seedling and seedling growth here. I believe these are seedlings. I don't think these are root suckers, as obviously a lot of shrubs can form thickets by producing root suckers. Root suckers. But the structure of these little guys here makes me think that this plant's seeds are quite viable. I usually don't come across a lot of seedlings, but then again, I don't come across this in super high numbers. So this is quite, it is quite a common specimen here in the west and the southwest. I'll include a more comprehensive uh, range of the plant. But here in Southern California, you can expect to find this and a lot of our major mountain ranges. San Gabriel Mountains, San Bernardino Mountains, the San Jacinto Mountains, I believe. Uh, Palomar Mountain has these. The Cuyamacas should have them. Here in the Lagunas, right next to the Cuyamacas, we have them. And I don't know if this goes into Baja, but we're pretty close to Mexico here anyway, so wouldn't be surprised if they make the jump over the political border. But I, like I said, I will give you a more, more of a full range of this. Well, let's just take some time to appreciate the beauty of this one specimen here. It's outstanding, the structure. Beautiful, broad crown shrub. Just absolute, absolutely beautiful. So this plant is an, attra is an attractive specimen most of the year. Whether it's some, sometimes the fall color, 
the fruits, the flowers, and their leafless, their leafless structure can be quite neat to look at. But there you have it. I'm a Lankier, Utah Utahensis, the Utah Service Berry. Found here in the Laguna Mountain Recreation Area of the Cleveland National Forest. So go check this shrub out. Later on during the summer, you might even be able to grab a small snack along the trail. So again, Amelanchier utahensis, member of the rose family, and the same subfamily as the apples, pears, and so forth. Live from Mount Laguna. This will, be, this will basically do it for Spotlight on Shrubs with Brian. Hope you found this one interesting, informative, and I sure hope you like the specimen I picked out for this video, because I sure do. Thanks for watching my Spotlight, and I'll see you on another Spotlight episode. Coming soon. Thanks for watching.